500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which is usually viewed as starting with Martin Luther nailing the 95 theses to the door in Wittenberg. This trial takes place four years later, and we have sort of the resolution of those issues in his statement before the church uh, council, the Diet of Worms, as it's called. Diet of Worms is not someone who eats worms. A diet was an imperial council that met in the city of Ver Worms, or as the Germans would pronounce it, Worms, and uh, this is what takes place. Our emphasis today, in light of preparation for our celebration later this month, is back to the Bible. As we move back to the Word of God, as we, as we see the, the thrust of the Reformation moving in this direction, <clears throat> this is Luther's statement which he made there at the end of that clip from the film. Since your majesty and your lordships desire <clears throat> a simple reply, I will answer without uh, horns and without teeth. Unless I'm convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. I don't think we can fully appreciate the courage and the strength that it took to make that statement in his context. He was standing totally alone. It's not often in our lives that we're asked to stand completely alone. It does happen once in a while for us. It does happen occasionally as we come face to face with issues of life and we're forced to make a decision. There are usually regarded to be five key principles to the whole process of this Protestant Reformation. The first of them, these are expressed in Latin phrases. The first is sola fides. Sola meaning only or alone, and fides is faith. So principle number one was faith alone. By faith alone, not by works, which had crept into the teaching of so many at that time. Second principle is sola gratia. Gratia is a Latin word for grace, grace alone. Salvation is by grace through faith. And that was a major principle because the church was teaching in so many ways that it was necessary to be in right relationship with the church. And, and Luther and others brought us back to the principle of sola gratia, grace alone. The third principle is sola scriptura. And you can read that, even though you may not be conversant with Latin, it's the scriptures alone. And that's the principle that we're going to look at today. That stands heart and soul in the very center of this whole movement that we call the Protestant Reformation and even down today in our lives. And then solus Christus is Christ alone. And so the the necessity of focusing on Jesus and Jesus alone in the process of one's salvation. And then finally, soli Dea Gloria, the glory of God alone, only God's glory. And these are the major principles. In those five principles, you can sort of summarize the Protestant Reformation, this entire movement that took place 500 years ago. And we stand on the shoulders of this movement. You might ask the question at this point, how did all this happen? How did it happen that we got so far away from the principles of God's word? And I would suggest that there are four or five things, maybe more, maybe others that we could figure on. One is illiteracy. It seems so strange to us in this world to think that in a group this size, if we were meeting in the days of Martin Luther, there would be maybe five or six of us who could read and write. In those days, almost no one 
could read and write unless you were in the upper class or the intelligentsia or you had in some way received special favor. We, we go to school, we get, we get tired of going to school. All right, we don't, sometimes we find ourselves not wanting to go to school. Those folks never went to school, most of them. And so they couldn't read. So even if they had a Bible, they couldn't read it. Shame on us for so little time that we spend in the Word, right? When we think about that. So this was a problem in those days. How would somebody come up with the answers that Martin Luther came up with when you can't read? Secondly, the Latin Vulgate was in vogue at that time. The Bible was translated into Latin at about 400 A.D. Jerome is credited with doing that. And by about 500 A.D., the Latin Vulgate takes over. And so instead of a Greek New Testament, we now have Latin. And so the church uses the Latin. As a matter of fact, it's still the case where the Latin Vulgate is the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. In those days, the, there would be a Bible in most churches, but it would be a Latin Bible. And so the people who couldn't read surely couldn't read Latin. And unfortunately, many of the priests even couldn't read. And as a result, what happens is you have no reliance on the Word of God. And so people aren't using the Bible. Because if they could get one, it would be in a language they couldn't read, and they couldn't read anyhow, so there's no sense in going that way. Thirdly, post-millennialism. And I know some of you, some of you chafe a little bit when we start to talk about premillennial and postmillennial and amillennial and all that sort of thing, but it really does matter. Postmillennialism is the teaching that the church is responsible for setting up the kingdom of God. And Jesus will return at some point after the kingdom has begun to take over his kingdom, hence post-millennial. He will return after, post, the start of the millennium. This is the Roman Catholic view of the kingdom of God. So Roman Catholicism has viewed, and you can, you can go back in church history and see how this works out, or, or even European history. Roman Catholicism viewed itself as the kingdom of God established here on the earth, and the, and the leaders of the church were to extend the church and the authority of the church as worldwide as possible, preparing the kingdom for Jesus to return. If you're a post-millennial, that's a logical thing. If you have a responsibility to set up the kingdom, and you, you're maintaining, controlling, running the world, as a kingdom for Jesus to return to, you could see how that could lead to certain practices that are not correct. And so postmillennialism feeds into all of this. There's a process that I call, I, I, I don't know what the official name of it is, but there's a process I call institutionalization. Institutionalization is a process whereby a, a, a ministry or a company or an organization which has begun for very valid purposes. Let's say you start a company to produce mousetraps. You have a very valid company, and there's enthusiasm if you have a better mousetrap. And so you start producing them, and people say, well, this really works well, and so the, the company grows. What happens over the course of years is that Institutions lose their original focus and perspective, and they reach a point where they begin to focus on self-preservation. So you have major companies, for example, in our world today, who are engaged in mergers and acquisitions. We, we, you read in the paper almost every week of companies that lay off like 1,000 workers or 5,000 workers or whatever. The whole thing is all about the bottom line. And what companies become concerned with and even consumed with is survival and the bottom line. And that's what happens in organizations. It happens in churches. It happens in other kinds of organizations and ministries as well. You lose the original focus and the original purpose and you begin to focus on yourself. 
And that happens. If you think about it, there are very few organizations that are 100 years or older that have survived. Only a handful. And the reason for that is because of this whole process, they, you go through a life cycle like this and eventually you die. And so what happened is that, is that churches, and it's all around us today, there are churches all around us that have become more concerned about surviving and maintaining their building or maintaining a certain program than they are in the purpose for which they were established to reach the community for Jesus and to grow people to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And then finally, there's always the issue of human carnality, human sinfulness. We are prone to sin. We have an old nature, and we have that tendency within us. And if we don't work hard at walking with Jesus, at confessing our sins, and at honoring Jesus with how we live, we incorporate into our lifestyle and into our ministry sinful behaviors. And then we get defensive about those things, and we begin then to defend the sinful behaviors, and as a result, we lose the vitality of the Spirit, we lose God's working in our midst, and we become just simply another human organization. All of these things, and maybe other things too, played into what was happening in the thousand years from about four or 500 A.D. down to the time of Martin Luther at 1500 A.D., and so there's all of these factors involved which created what we call, what, what historians call, the Dark Ages. They're Dark Ages because people pushed aside the Word of God, because they ignored those principles. Now, you don't have to go too far to, to, to draw some parallels between what was happening then and what's happening in our country now. As we, as a people as a nation, have pushed the Bible out of our public venues. We have pushed God out of the public venues and so on. And so some of the same things that were happening then are happening now. As we have gone through some of these same processes, um, it's a different day, but the end result is often the same. Now, that's the problem of authority. One writer says it this way. From the very beginning of the Protestant Reformation, the issue of the authority of the Scriptures stood in a central place. When Luther was asked how he knew that his interpretations of the Bible were right and how he could stand against the interpretations of the church fathers and the church prior to him, he replied that the message of salvation in the Bible was so clear that even a farm boy behind a plow could understand the message as correctly as the most learned theologians in the universities. The people of God did not need some imposed authority to interpret the Bible for them. And that was one of the major principles in this struggle that took place. Now, we need to be careful here. We live in a culture that is very independent. We prize independence as a nation. And there's a tendency for us to swing too far the other way. We have to be careful about that. There's a tendency for us to go too far and to say, well, my interpretation of the scriptures is correct. There needs to be a balance in here. In those days, the balance was the other way. You were forced, as we saw in the video clip, you were being forced to believe what church authorities said was correct rather than what the Bible said. And so we have this issue that takes place. Now, what I want us to do this morning for a few minutes is to focus on where does authority come from? And the source of authority really comes from the Word of God. There's several places we could go in the Scriptures. Today we're going to the story of Joshua at the very beginning of the book of Joshua. And what we have is a situation that presents a, a struggle as, as we come to this first chapter of Joshua, we reread, it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, how would you have felt 
if you had been Joshua, what do you know about what he was going through at this point? What are some of the things you know about Joshua? One of the two spies, right, who went into the land and gave a good report, and so he survived the 40 years in the wilderness. Good. Moses' assistant. Who said that? Sharon, thank you. Go to the, come right up here to the head of the class, Sharon. <laughs> Moses' assistant, right, for 40 years. He was alongside of Moses for 40 years. How long is 40 years? That's a long time, isn't it? It's almost as long as I've lived. <laughs> it's a long time, 40 years. I mean, most people are thinking what at the end of a 40-year career? Retirement, right? If you worked for a company for 40 years, you're usually thinking retirement at this point. What else? Okay, good. He was there when, when Moses came down. Actually, he didn't wait for him to come down, if I may correct you. May I do that? He was with Moses on the mountain, and he came down with him. But he did wait for Moses. You're correct. He did wait for Moses in the tent of meeting. Often, Moses would go in to meet with the Lord, and, and Joshua would be with him, and Moses would come out to talk to the people, and Joshua would stay in the tent with the Lord. And so he had a heart for the Lord in that process. I think one of the things that strikes me about all of this is that Moses has been the leader for 40 years. 40 years is a, is a whole generation. That's a long time to live under one leader. And so for that 40 years, and you have the nation of Israel dying off, almost all of them, who were all of them who were 20 years and older died off. And so you have a whole new nation, and they have only ever lived under Moses, and now, jo now Joshua is supposed to step up. The Bible says that Moses is dead. And we read in the last chapter of Deuteronomy that the nation of Israel mourned for Moses for 30, 30 days. And so it was appropriate for them to mourn. In some ways, they had a better system because there was an official 30-day period in which the whole nation mourned Moses' death. They lost someone who had given them so much in terms of the written record, in terms of his leadership, in terms of his compassion and his care and his presence and his interfacing with the Lord on their behalf and so forth. All of this stuff Moses had provided and now he's gone. And so the nation of Israel mourned for him. But now Joshua is expected to lead. It's one thing to serve at the right hand of Moses and to always have Moses to rely on. To always say, well, Moses, what are we going to do in this situation? And now he doesn't have that. And so it's at this juncture of the history of Israel that we have this this statement coming from the Lord. The Lord says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Get up and move on. There's an appropriate time for mourning, but then you have to get up and go on. We hurt with people who have lost loved ones, but there comes a time when you have to get up and move on. And so God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Get up. Arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people. Suddenly, he has the weight of the two and a half million people that Moses had been carrying for the last 40 years. And so you have this circumstance given with regard to Joshua. So how do you handle this? Well, I think there, just as we move through this passage... There are four things that I think are helpful for us here. And when you face these kinds of situations as well, number one, accept the realities. All right? 
Moses is commanded by God to recognize, excuse me, Joshua is commanded by God to recognize that Moses is dead. Moses is gone. So he says, Moses is gone. You get up now and move on. Secondly, affirm the promises that God has given you. He says several things in this passage. He says, all of the places that your feet touch, I will give to you. Number two, he says to him, no man will be able to stand against you. In the same way nobody could stand against Moses, nobody will be able to stand against you. And he says, I will give this land to my people through you. So he has these promises. You and I have promises from God. We have promises from the word of God that provide direction for us, that provide a sense of confidence. And so we list those promises and we focus on them as we seek to live faithfully in our relationship with the Lord. Thirdly, to act with courage. This statement makes it clear that it wasn't easy for Joshua to do this. He had lived, in a sense, in the shadow for 40 years. He had lived in a sort of comfortable, uncomfortable spot, hadn't he? It was comfortable in the sense that there was always Moses to go to, and Moses was always the responsible one, but it was uncomfortable in that he couldn't make the decisions. You've been there? Have you been in that spot? And so now he says to Joshua, act with courage. He says, be strong and very courageous. He says it to him three times in the passage, to be strong and courageous. And so Joshua, we can understand from that, is struggling with the stepping up to take the leadership. And rightfully so. It is a daunting thing for him to do. We read it and we know the rest of the story. Many of us already know how the book of Joshua turns out. And so we see God providing miraculous um, uh, deliverance. We see them marching around the city of Jericho and the walls falling down and all that sort of thing. And we just sort of rejoice in that. But, but this was a big, big deal for Joshua to do this. And the final thing that he says, and that we need to practice as well, is that we need to follow God's word. See what he says as we come to the end? He says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. Do not deviate to the right or to the left, but follow the law. Follow what Moses has written down for you. And so this is the, this is the um, charge which Joshua receives at this point. I put in here our church doctrinal statement. Uh, it begins like this. It's Article 3 of our Constitution. We read this, this statement of faith, that is the document that follows in Article 3, is comprehensive but no, by no means exhaustive. And yet it's satisfactory in that it covers the salient teaching of the Scriptures and of Christianity. It is to be interpreted and expressed in and according to the natural and literal meaning of the respective passages of Scripture which are presented under each article. And then it proceeds. And the very first paragraph, then, after this introduction, is one that deals with the Scriptures. Because the Scripture stands as the point of our, of our authority. It stands as the document from which we draw all other truth. And so we read these words. We believe... This is our statement as a church. As a member of the church, you bought into this as well. We believe in the verbal inspiration, that is, word by word, and the consequent divine authenticity and authority of the Old and New Testaments, 66 books in all. We hold to the inspiration of each book. Inspiration means that each book is breathed out by God. Each book comes directly from God through the Spirit of God and the human authors. The inspiration of each book, of every word and every letter down to the smallest particle of a letter. You have to get into the Hebrew letters to understand all that. Um, and, and that's of the original scripture. 
We concede the human infirmity and error characterize the translation of the scripture. So translations are sometimes limited. And so we have some difficulty with that. But hold that absolute perfection is stamped upon the original writings so that the result is the very word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And that's a significant line here for us today. The only infallible rule of faith and practice is what this book says. Moreover, it's our conviction that God has exercised such singular care and conviction um, and uh, care and providence through the ages in preserving the written word that the scriptures as we now have them are in every essential particular as originally given and contain all the things necessary to salvation. So that's our statement with regard to this book. This is what we believe. This becomes then our authority, the authority by which we live. Now, how do we use that authority? And I want to wrap up in a few minutes here with these last two verses in Joshua. The use of the authority begins, first of all, with the statement, this book shall not depart from your mouth. What does that mean? The book shall not depart from your mouth. I see a lot of you intently watching me this morning. But I don't see anybody with a book in his mouth. This book shall not depart from your mouth. Why doesn't he say this book shall not depart from your library? Okay, because most of them didn't read at this point, and they didn't have books, all right? Why doesn't he say, this book shall not depart from your mind? Because you don't have a, a mind? Is that what you said? Okay, not in your mind? You want them to think, yeah, but wouldn't you say then this book of the law shall not depart from your mind? No, I'm saying he wants them to speak the truth to the Bible and the law. Okay, all right. Yeah. It ought to, that, that, that first line ought to sort of raise questions for us. It ought to say, what does this mean? I have to think about this a little bit. Shall not depart from your mouth. And so then we look at the next line, and he says, but you shall meditate on it day and night. So not departing from your mouth is the negative statement. Meditate on it day and night is the positive statement. This should not happen, but this should happen. Now, what's really interesting is that the word meditate while we always think in terms of English language, meditate, to think, the Hebrew word is the word haga. And the Hebrew word is a word that's translated in a number of places in the Old Testament that means to mutter or to mumble. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but I, I have a little workshop at home. It's a mess, and I wouldn't want you to see it right now, but I have this workshop at home, and when I do chores in my workshop, I mutter and I mumble. <laughs> do any of you do that? Do you talk to yourself when you do something you're not real handy at doing? Any of you ever put toys together at Christmas time? Yeah. Do you talk to yourself when you do that? Yeah, that's, that's Haggah. That's meditating. What you do is you talk your way through the process. And so to, to um, meditate on the word of God day and night means that you talk the word of God day and night. So Carol was right on when she says he, he doesn't want it to get out of our minds. And the way that he keeps it in our minds is he keeps it in our mouth. What you talk about is what you think about. Right? What do you talk about when you're 
thrust in a situation where you don't have anything to talk about. What do you talk about? About how the Eagles are going to win today, right? You talk about the weather, right? You talk about the price of eggs. The price of rice. Somebody show him the door. What other things do you talk about? Kids. Kids. Talk about your kids, right? You talk about the things that are important to you. So what he's saying is, this book of law shall not depart from your mouth. So they didn't have a copy that they put in their back pocket or in their phone. So what they would do is they would listen to Moses and they would take a verse from God's word and they would put it in their mouth. They would talk, they would talk it. For example, if you say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Not a Lord. Not some Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is is my shepherd, not some other character. The Lord is my shepherd, not was. He was, but the word says is. Not will be. He will be, but the the word says the Lord is my shepherd. And so you work through that. You just keep that word on your mouth. Just like you were trying to put together those toys at Christmas or you're working on that handyman project at home, you keep talking the scriptures. That's what he's looking for here. You see, the reason for that is because Isaiah says, and if you've been around here very long, you know this is one of our favorite passages. Isaiah says, God says through Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God thinks on a whole different level from us. And in order for us to think and act on his level, in order for us not to deviate to the right or to the left, we have to have the word of God in our mouth. It has to be something that we are thinking about and talking about and working through. So you take the principle of God's word, you take some statement from God that's, that's relative, relevant to your particular circumstance. Whatever your issue is, you find the principle from God's word and you talk that instead of asking the advice of all your fellow workers. Instead of taking a poll on the internet, what do you do if such and such happens? We don't go to the internet, we come to the word of God and we take the word of God and we We chew on that. We mutter the word as we live out our lives. That's what he's saying. It takes work to think God's thoughts. They don't come naturally. They don't just come. You don't just sort of sit back in your easy chair and say, Lord, give me your thoughts for today. (laughs) Doesn't happen that way. If that's how you live, you will always respond in the flesh, in the old nature. So you have to be in the word. You have to take the word, put it into your mouth, and you have to talk the word in order for that to become then your way of life, your pattern. That's what he wants for us. The New Testament says it this way. All scripture is inspired by God as God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that the man of God, that's you, that's me, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That's what the Bible is designed to do. And so you and I have to work at it to make that happen. The result then is that we're to to be careful to do all that is written in it. And the way, we be, the way we're careful to do everything written in it is we're constantly talking it. We're constantly muttering. We're, we're, we're speaking the word of God all the time. 
And so, so this is what God says to Joshua. This is, Joshua, this is how you do it. I'm asking you to do something which is, which is monumental. I'm asking you to do something which is way out of your comfort zone. Although you have been watching for 40 years, now suddenly when it's thrust upon you, here's how you do it, Joshua. You accept the realities of the situation. You move on and you be courageous. You be strong. You be brave. And you chew on God's word every day and put that into practice in your life. That's what he's asking us to do. That's what he wants for us. And what happens is that makes your way prosperous. He says, so that you will make your way prosperous and you will have success. That's what he has for us. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be successful. And what happens is it takes effort. You have to get up early in the morning. You have to get up a half hour early. You have to set aside the time. But you know what? God rewards you in that time. It gets so exciting as you read the word and you pick this verse that God has for you today or this thought that comes out of the word and you start to meditate on this thought. You start to chew on it. And as you mumble that thought throughout the day, God puts that into practice in your life. And it becomes amazingly dynamic and exciting. God is not, is not trying to do something to make life boring and hard. He's trying to guide you and me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake in ways that bring excitement and joy and fulfillment. He wants to provide success and prosperity in our walk with him. Now, when we get to the end of the month of October, we're going to focus on the Reformation but in some ways, we need to put the principles of the Reformation into practice in our lives right now. We need to make the Word of God that which guides us. Luther said, feelings come and feelings go. And feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the Word of God. Naught else is worth believing. And that's what gave him the courage to stand like Joshua to have the courage to stand in the face of possibility of death. John Huss was executed for similar statements just a handful of years before Luther. And that memory had to be vivid in his mind as he made those statements that day. God help you and me as we seek to be faithful to the word in what we do. Father, help us as we walk with you this week I don't know the challenges that every one of us is facing, but I know in every life, the evil one wants to derail us. He wants to get us off track. He wants to turn us away from the truth of the word. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us. Help us in that job situation. Help us in that family relationship. Help us in that, in that challenge that we're facing in our neighborhood. Help us in our own personal walk with you, to be faithful to your word, to plumb the depths of, of your word and, and to take those principles and put them into practice. We ask for that help. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.